Blog Talk Radio. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. Om Shabbat Shalom, Holy Way of the Most High. Om Shabbat Shalom, I sense your presence. And I am the light within your soul In the essence of truth and right Love makes the circle whole And here we stand in line Waiting for some sacred sign But to find the balance is the purpose of this time to restore the balance of the universal mind And in the presence of my Lord of light and love Everything I see aspiring to be free And when I call to thee And come on bending knee Surrender to the all-pervading light and love Reflections of the one surrounding me with love And I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence I sense your presence Within and without, above and below, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. Without and within, below and above, yeah, yeah. East, west, north, and south, I sense your presence. I sense your presence. Om 
shepherd shalom Holy angel of the most high Oh shepherd shalom I sense your presence I sense your presence Thank you for joining me here tonight on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour My name is Jessie Ann Nichols-George, and I am your hostess. The music you were listening to there at the beginning of the show is I Sense Your Presence. It's by Shemshai, and they're a group that I met while I was in the Arizona area, and now they're wonderfully touring around the world, cutting more and more CDs all the time. They have some brand new music out, which you can always connect with at uh, facebook.com, Shemshai, I believe it is. And... uh, I just want to say welcome back to those that are returning and welcome to those that are joining us for the first time. Here at Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, what I do is I look at different ways that compassion exists in our lives. I look at the ways to remove blocks, obstacles, frustrations, resistances, and more. Some weeks I'm doing discussing like different aspects of how compassion works in our life, how it fits into our life and the different areas of compassion. And some weeks I'm doing more exercises and practical implementations. And then many times I will have guests on the show so that you can learn more about their work and how other things complement and work with compassion. I also highlight different musical artists along the way. Not too long ago I had Stephen Halpern on the show. I've had Jill Mattson on the show. Um, Peter Kerr coming up uh, the first part of August. He's a uh, seven-time Grammy nominee for Best New Age Artist. And also I'm going to have nights once in a while that are maybe a coaching night or um, taking callers, so you have to just pay attention and listen for when those are coming up and coming through. And uh, it just is a a great opportunity for you to come in and learn about a lot of different people's work and what's happening. I also focus in my own work on helping people find and use compassion in their everyday life. I've created the Genesis Clearing Statement, which some of you have experienced on previous shows. And if you've missed any of that, you can go back and catch it in the archives. As a matter of fact, um, back last fall, Kevin interviewed me on that work, and we did some great work with using the compassion, uh, with using the Genesis Clearing Statement at that time. So if you've missed that, you can go back and catch it. I currently have two books available right now. um, That is Activating Compassion and Activating Compassion, the workbook. And I'm getting ready to release my next set of books. It's written... I'm just working on the publishing part of it, so I appreciate everybody's patience with me in getting those put out. In addition, I've created the Compassion Tour, which is a multi-state nationwide tour, including workshops, retreats, seminars, book signings, and fundraising events, and I am in the process of setting up some dates for this upcoming fall for the 2013 tour. That uh, is looking like it might even take me in around the Vancouver, Canada area, so For those of you just across the border up there, I might be headed your way. You can also follow any of the events I have to register for on the Compassion Tour and also off of the Compassion Tour at jessieannicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com. And I've actually got quite a few events up right now, events for relationships, passion in relationships, building your abundance and success and presence and Um, personal emergence things, so lots of incredible workshops available. You can check them out there. Uh, There's also an option for gifting the tour there, as well as also I have an option on Indiegogo for um, those people who would like to help me raise money for the Compassion Tour because when I'm doing the fundraising events, actually 90% of what I take in goes to the um, organization that I'm fundraising for. So that's a great way to kind of give and help people out and help me get around to those events. And just a reminder, if you enjoy the show, make certain that you share it with your friends, your family, significant others. Put it out there around the social media, things like that. Um, They can always come back and listen to it through the same link in the archive. And they can do that, or they can also find the archive shows on my website at jessieannicholsgeorge1. That's the number one dot com. And also they can find it on my Activating Compassion Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash activating compassion forward slash notes, and I keep all of the archive shows there as well. Now, before I get started every week, I like to kind of delve into 
the 72 Names of God, Technology for the Soul. And what I do is I like to just randomly open up, because I always find when you do this that it always has a really appropriate message for the week. And what I do is just kind of focus in on on what we need to hear and what we need to get. And this message then is posted on um, my website under the Main Street Universe tab under my name. And let's see what we've got tonight from Yehuda. And tonight's message, or the tonight's name of God, is soulmate. And this is going to be an interesting component here um, because our discussion tonight is on reincarnation. And so soulmates actually can have a really appropriate fit here. And with it, his message says, Looking for the perfect date, the ideal mate, true friends, loyal associates, or the right business partner. And then the insight he gives on this is, when a single unified soul is set to enter into this material dimension, it is first divided into two halves, male and female. As these two halves of one soul undergo transformation in the physical world, either through suffering and ordeal or through proactive spiritual transformation, they progressively draw closer to one another. The uniting of two halves of one soul is an inevitable fate, but the timing depends upon their level of spirituality. When the time is ripe, true soulmates find one another even if they are worlds apart, whether physically, on opposite sides of the globe, or spiritually, with contrasting lifestyles and backgrounds. Moreover, the concept of soulmates does not refer only to marriage. The concept of soulmates applies also to relationships with friends, business colleagues, and partners in every sort of shared endeavor. So this is very interesting because when we're talking about these cycles, which we're going to be talking about tonight, these soul cycles that we go through, and oftentimes people have this romanticized ideal of what a soulmate is. Isn't that that person you meet and you fall madly in love and you can't be without them and you're completely inseparable and and things like that? But soulmates are not always like that when we meet them in the physical world. Sometimes they're with us for a short period of time. Sometimes they come in as a friend. They don't always come in as a lover or romantic partner or things like that. So they come in a lot of different shapes and forms. And oftentimes soulmates are a part of the different cycles that we have and they can be a reflection, or they could be somebody on an opposing side that might even show up as a so-called, what we might term as an enemy. Um, they, they come in as all different ways and shapes and forms, and that's the thing to keep in mind with them. So this actually is a very appropriate message tonight. Now, the meditation that Yehuda gives with this is, the energy of soulmates is aroused through this sequence of letters. You attract the other half of your soul. All of your existing relationships are deeply enriched, imbued with soulmate energy. And that soulmate energy, what it is, is it's a, it's almost kind of a sense of feeling complete in a way, and, and we're working on finding that with ourselves as well. So it's not also separated, and it brings us back also what Yehud is talking about, that unified concept of viewing everybody to a certain extent as a soulmate and seeing that soulmate in them because whether they're yours or somebody else's, we all have that soulmate energy. And the the way that this name is pr- pronounced is Shin Aleph He. So that's Shin Aleph He. And the, and the name, the common name is soulmate. And I love Yehuda's work because it just takes these big giant concepts and put them into everyday language for us, everyday concepts for us. So that's that's our message tonight from Yehuda. And uh, just to delve into our topic a little bit, uh, it's that time of year. And here in the U.S., we put a focus on honoring those that have been in battle for our country. There's no question that we greatly appreciate all of those that have helped us to obtain our independence and who have maintained it along the way. And however, when I think of war, it brings to mind much bigger concepts than any one country or battle. It brings to mind the aspect of how wars 
of many kinds go on generation after generation. Now, there's the thought that a great deal of this is not just about defense or even power and control. However, it is about souls that are trying to resolve a cycle that they have found themselves in. There are many thoughts where in reincarnation that feel that we come back with the same people until we or the other soul chooses to stop the cycle. This thought explains war by saying that those who were bombed or on the defense will come back as the bombers or on the offense, and those then come back as those that were bombed or on the defense. So it's a rotating cycle in there. And and I don't I don't want there to be confusion. I'm not saying that war is absolutely a part of the soul process, but what I'm saying is for some souls, war is a vehicle of how they work their lessons out along the way. So the cycle continuing continues, and like I said, until one or the other person involved breaks it with love or compassion or something of that type of energy. Now, war seems to be one of many patterns that cycle like this. We have rich, poor patterns. We have healers and sickly patterns. We have victim perpetrators patterns and so on. And it's a concept that we don't like to think about that we may have actually chose such options. We may have chose to be poor. We may have chose to take under some conditions. And this also plays into some of the concepts of karma, which we discussed a few weeks back. If you missed that show, you can go back and catch it in the archives. And we had uh, Tina on uh, talking about karma, Tina Irwin, at that time. Now, I think a part of the key with these cycles is to realize the lessons that we're trying to learn through these cycles, such as letting go of revenge, learning to get along with others instead of fight them, become leaders and not followers. And and there again, that's a term that can be touchy for people, leaders and followers, because ideally we're hoping to break that cycle and not have to have leaders and followers, but be sharing and exchanging energy. And we uh, are trying to choose creation instead of destruction and so on. Now, Dr. Dorothy Nettermeyer focuses on these very cycles, and she looks at why we choose these patterns and continue to perpetuate these cycles. She seeks to help others understand why they choose to reincarnate into these cycles over and over again. And could it be that we really want to repeat these patterns over and over again? I mean, have you thought about the patterns that you are repeating as a soul? And what are you doing to break the patterns that you have been repeating lifetime after lifetime? And the guest that I have tonight, and she seems to be running a little bit late, so I'm hanging in there and um, and seeing if she kind of pops in here on me. But uh, she deals with a component of compassion that is related to the aspect in my books known as the hidden enemy. And in this point, we are so busy judging people and situations that we see with our eyes that are unable to see, really see what and know what is happening. So what happens is we look only with our physical eyes instead of really looking deeper, and that's where the judgment is coming from. This is easy to do with war situations and PTSD, and other trauma victims. And many want them to just get over it. You know, Why can't they just get over this, this frustration or this stress that they've had? Isn't it in the past? Um, much easier said than done for a lot of people. And others want to pamper them like babies, and others feel like they don't have to be in war and could just choose something else. So all of these are judgments. Now tonight we're going to look even deeper beyond what we can see as it relates to this. I'm going to take a short break, and when we return, hopefully I will have been able to connect with Dr. Dorothy and have her with us, and uh, the plan is to have her sharing her work on PTSD and the reincarnation cycles that are associated with war. And the song that I have for you during the break tonight is called Dia Harmonies. It's by Claire Hedin. If you would like to find out more about her work or connect with more of her music, you can do so at www.
clairehedin.com, and that's C-L-A-R-E-H-E-D-I-N.com, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Oh, dear, dear little light, shine forth, shine forth thy beauty. You came, you went, t'was brief and rare. We loved you and we love you. So thank you, yes, thank you. We thank you oh so deeply. And thank you, yes, thank you. We thank you for your visit. We know your time with us was brief, but still was time well valued. You have a place in hearts and minds down here on earthly fallows. Your light will shine and dance you will upon the skies of spirit. We learn, we love, we touch, we part, we feel the circles healing. So thank you, yes, thank you, we thank you oh so deeply. listening to Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour, and my name is Jessie Ann Nichols-George. I am your hostess this evening. You were just listening to a song called Dia Harmonies by Claire Hedin. And again, if you'd like to find out more about her music, you can certainly do so at www.clairehedin.com, and that's C-L-A-R-E-H-E-D-I-N.com. And we actually did a show with Claire. I did one with her. It was the last show of 2012. And really beautiful show. If you missed that show by any chance, I highly suggest going back and listening to it in the archives. We had a great evening there, really featuring a variety of her different music and and, uh, learning about who she is and all the incredible projects that she's working on to help the earth and help people connect with the earth. I, I seem to have a little problem. Our guest seems to be a little bit delayed. I've, I've got a message in to our guest tonight, and um, so hopefully she's going to show up a little bit. Uh, the good side of things is I actually happen to have a background <laughs> in soul cycle and reincarnation, as I, use, as I used to actually do um, past life re- regressions with people. So uh, I've got a little bit of background here that we can work with, and certainly if anybody has anything that they would like to call in and and share in regards to maybe any of their experiences or type it into chat, I can see you there in chat. Um, Any experiences that you have, we can certainly discuss it there. Now, reincarnation is one of those things that is very interesting when we delve into it because... It's a part and a way of getting to know yourself. It's it's a means or a tool that allows us to understand more of who we are as a soul, the experiences that we've had in the past. 
And in doing this and in delving into our past lives and delving in and understanding the patterns and the cycles that we've been through in our life, what we do is we gain a really strong understanding of partly our our life mission or our our spirit purpose, our, our soul's awareness, our soul's desire and passions and drives and it also really helps us understand the lessons that we're working on. Um, one thing that reincarnation tends to do a lot of times until we evolve more and more as a soul is it tends to put us in these extremes. So when we are dealing with extremes, when we're dealing with patterns, whether they are abuse patterns or whether they're war patterns or whether they're money patterns or things like that, that it's all... It's all an attempt to bring balance. So we start at these very, very far extremes and we keep working our way in until we start to find a balance and a peacefulness with that energy or with that cycle that is going on. So certainly there's a lot of people out there that they like to remember the really pleasant lifetimes, (laughs) right? They like to remember when they were a ruler or they were really rich in a castle somewhere um, things like that that are you know resonate with them. I think in some ways people draw to them, and and part of that is is because we like to remember the things that are pleasant. We like to remember the the parts of our previous lives that are enjoyable, and um, so I think that that's a that's a big piece. Now, if you're going to somebody and you're seeking past life regression. Uh, I know that there are some people that have found ways to do this via Skype or things like that um, where they have a little bit of a visual with the person. Uh, I know myself when I used to do past life regressions that I would only do them in person. And the reason for that is because when you go into a past life regression session and you're and you're tapping in, a lot of times you can tap in to a very traumatic event. And this is, uh, for example, the the guest that we're waiting for tonight um, delves into. When you're delving into the painful memories, when you're delving into the traumatic events, like going back to heal, for example, being in war, um, there are a lot of triggers that can come up. There are a lot of reactions that can come up. And because you're in a very deep, deep state of relaxation, it's important to have somebody there who is actually able to monitor some of your your vitals to a certain extent to make sure your breathing is staying stabilized or that can bring you out of that past life regression easily, um, that knows how to work you through those trauma situations. So it's not something that I would say you know, if somebody has just been certified in it and they've only been doing it for two months, <laughs> um, it's one thing if it's a little bit of fun, but uh, you definitely want to be be very careful about the experience level and how that person is entering into it and, and how they're proceeding with it. Now, for a lot of people, this process is really very similar, I would say, to a deep level of meditation, Um it's very similar and you're taking your breathing to a very, very relaxed state. You're taking your mind, you're letting it go away from the really conscious physical level and you're letting it get out there and explore. And I can't say that there's a 100% definite answer of how you know that this is a past life versus uh, just a vision you're having or a dream you're having. But oftentimes you will remember things or you will feel them as if you're actually living them, as if you're actually going through that experience. Usually when you're doing a past life regression, if you're actually tapping into a past life or a parallel life or something of that nature, what you're doing is... It's just like almost like a waking conscious in a sense, but you're in a different setting. You're in a different time, perhaps, um, things like that that you're tapping into. So 
it's not it's not like where some dreams or things like that where you feel outside of yourself where you can see yourself walking around um, you're you're actually getting that experience and that is part of why it is so so very important I think to have somebody that has got some system set up for monitoring you when you're in a past life regression. Um, I used to tell my clients when I was working with them in this capacity that, you know, I never knew exactly how long a session would take. And I might book an hour session, but then I would have to end up um, preparing for it to turn into two hours because once they're in that experience and once they're grabbing it and once they're getting it, you can't always just suddenly shock them out of the experience. They need to be able to go through it and resolve the issue. Um, the thing that is important to know, much like meditation, when you're in a past life regression, you do have control over your circumstances. You do have that ability to come back at any time. And oftentimes, a lot of the regressionists I know will use some sort of ta uh, tonation or a bell or something like that that they will use to gradually bring you in and out of those states of being in past life regression. So um, definitely that's kind of a starting point. And, and that's why, for example, if I was doing it, I would never do it in any way other than as a live person-to-person -person being in the same room because here again, you get into a situation and it's just like you're experiencing it. So your, your breathing can go to a very rapid pace. It can start experiencing the panic or the fear or things like that. So it, it is really important to have somebody there watching that and paying attention as your breathing getting too fast or things like that so that they know that they can bring you out um, of that situation. And then a lot of times, at least what I used to do with my clients was to talk with them about the experiences and see what they were picking up and see how it applies to their current life. Um, certainly there, there are always, again, going to be those patterns. Our, our soul perpetuates these patterns over and over again um, with these aspects. And so I think that that's important. Then, then I would go through, for example, a discussion with them about what they experienced, about that time period, about the value that that might have in their soul process and looking at different things. So definitely a very important thing. Now, I have found a way recently to tap into past lives um, and to access the type of energy and the types of lifetimes that people have experienced. And I've learned to do that actually using to row deck to focus, so kind of a blend between um, tuning into the energy and tuning into the vibration of the person, but also using the, the to row to refine and to, to gain some additional uh, insights as to time styles and periods and energies, whether somebody's been masculine or feminine in different lifetimes. Um, I did that recently with a client and it was very useful because they could see these different lifetimes. Now, there are some different patterns I notice when we delve into to past lives. And one of those patterns is that oftentimes we will tend to stick to one type of energy or another. It won't be 100%, but it might be 75% of the time or 85% of the time. Um, so, for example, a lot of times a male will be that masculine energy in a good portion of their lives, and women will be uh, a feminine energy in a good portion of their lives. Uh, this is also where we can sometimes see the flip in people's energies. Uh, for example, you, you have a woman in this lifetime, but she's got a very masculine energy current to her. And it's very likely on her soul level she may be more of a masculine energy. She may be primarily a masculine energy, but this lifetime chose to incarnate as a female and vice versa. Um, our souls will oftentimes have at least a couple of lifetimes in its 
it's balancing energy because it needs that experience to understand what that opposite energy is like, to understand and to balance it. Here again, it's about balancing because even when we're primarily a feminine energy or a masculine energy, we're still looking to find the balance of our polar opposite energy in there. So it can be very fascinating that way. And this is another reason why when you go through regressions, oftentimes you're going to find that somebody is is oftentimes finding themselves mostly as a female or mostly as a male. So, for example, in a lot of my past life regressions, I'm mostly a female. I have had a couple of past lives as a male. Um, I, I know that I had one that was more of a farmer kind of country lifestyle as a male. I know that I was in medieval times once uh, with a more masculine energy around some of the medieval castle areas like that. Now, uh, when we look at sceneries, uh, oftentimes you'll find in a current lifetime that you will find yourself drawn to certain things. Uh, you'll find yourself drawn to certain cultures, and you may not understand why. I've got a friend who uh, never formally learned the, the language of German, and yet she was able to speak German practically fluently. I have no question she's had past lives in Germany <laughs> somewhere. So definitely these things are things to pay attention to because oftentimes when we're drawn to the Egyptian culture or an Asian culture or a certain type of lifestyle, it's because it was most likely a favorable lifestyle for us. It was most likely a learning lifestyle for us. Um, now, as our soul evolves and as our soul progresses on with things, um, in other words, we're developing, we're becoming wiser, we're becoming more conscious, more aware of things. Uh, one thing I've noticed as a pattern in past life regressions is that uh, that soul will tend to have many lifetimes and they'll have them in multiple cultures. So oftentimes when I find people are coming up with past lives in a multi multiple times, multiple cultures, uh, the older souls tend to show up at very pivotal times in history, um, near the end of Atlantis, um, near the end of the Dark Ages, things like that. They're, they tend to really have a big impact on transitions, on changing of cultures, changing of times. So oftentimes I do. I'll find that it's very common with an older soul that they will have been in Egyptian times, Grecian times, medieval times, um, Asian times, Asian cultures, uh, American cultures, country things. They've got a huge diversity in what they're offering and what they know. And this also is a reason why we find that we have an affinity or we know information about a culture and there's no real explanation or no real studying of it in in our current lifetime. Um, now regression, uh, you know, again, can lead us in a lot of ways. And, and one of the topics, because this was the first of three shows in a series of shows on PTSD, and with that, um, it brings up an interesting cycle that tends to happen. And, and again, I'm, I'm staying open to anybody who wants to, to call in and share any of their experiences with, with past lives and, and with regression work and things like that. But again, as I mentioned, one thing that we really tend to do is we tend to go through these cycles. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, before we went through our break song, is somebody will alternate, for example, between being rich or being poor, between being an abuser or being a victim. They will alternate between being a ruler and being a servant. Um, and then as we look at that in wars, they will alternate between sometimes battles and being completely pacifistic. Um, 
but it brings us to another piece of things, which is, is kind of like the message we got from Yehuda with soulmates um, and beyond soulmates, where we seem to have certain souls that we reincarnate with over and over again. And we'll oftentimes see this, for example, in family patterns. So somebody who's a mother in one lifetime might have been a child in a different lifetime, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we see that, that we make agreements with different souls in order to help us learn our lessons, which is where soulmates come in. They come in to, to help us accomplish certain things, to understand certain yearnings. Now, when we start to apply this with wars, it, it actually explains and gets into a little bit with why we have per perpetual cycles. You'll notice there are certain parts of the world that the wars never seem the, to end. Um, Iran and Iraq, uh, for example, are one of those cultures that tend to perpetually be in war with each other, um, countries that constantly are fighting each other. We wonder sometimes, for example, in natural disasters, we've seen it lately, right, with the bombings that have gone on, um, the Sandy Hook uh, situation, the Boston uh, Marathon bombings, um, the, the, the towers and things like that. And, of course, there's a lot of aspects that we could probably <laughs> delve into with conspiracy areas and go into whole other realms there. But... Uh, Realistically, what happens that, that we don't see, you know, our hearts go out and we think there's, there's a lot of sadness because here's, here's these poor people that seem like absolute victims. What we don't realize is that bigger picture that who was a victim in this lifetime very easily and very possibly um, may have been the perpetrator in a previous lifetime. And so what we do is we will reincarnate over and over again in order to balance the cycle. We'll reincarnate over and over again. So you'll have, for example, these perpetual wars that go on generation after generation, era after era. You know, we've, we've seen these in a lot of different times throughout where we had a lot of battles in the medieval area and, and we've had a lot of battles between Asian countries and and, of course, in the Middle East and things like that. And, and what happens is you get a soul, and oftentimes the ones that I see, particularly as they're related to war, particularly as they're related to battle situations, I oftentimes find these to be younger souls. And this is my, my personal observation, um, that they tend to be younger souls because they're very reactionary and they're they're living from a more animalistic base. So what happens is they don't understand the attack, they don't understand being in this war thing, but their soul is, is, is remembering, it's remembering who did it. And as a young soul, it hasn't evolved into getting out of that cycle or healing the situation. What it does is it, it's looking for revenge, okay? Think, think of a child, right, a really young child, maybe four, five, six years old, right, and, and it gets hit. You know, another child comes up and punches it in the arm, right? Well, the first reaction it has is, well, it might cry, <laughs> but the first reaction is a lot of times to turn around and punch back. And so this is what we see with this, this war cycling back and forth that has gone on generation after generation. These tend to be very young souls, and they keep coming back trying to take revenge. And I find this interesting during the times that we're in now where we are evolving and we're emerging and we're working on breaking these patterns and we, we, are, we are working and raising our dimensional energy up so that we're moving out of these war situations. So when we look at that in some of these cycles, what we're going to be finding is these souls will still have to have a way to resolve with each other. It just may not be in a formal war situation, but they're still going to have to resolve. 
So there's always a healing that's looking to happen. Uh, and, and it's something, again, that we don't like to admit. We don't like to admit that I might have done something in a past life that's caused that person to come after me. Um, yes, sometimes there are occasionally you know, so-called innocent victims in a situation, but a lot of times it is the cycle of young souls that just don't want to give up. They don't want to let go of the situation. Okay? I mean, how many times have you known somebody who's been an abuser or been a victim and they don't want to let go of their situation? They, they, they continue to stay in it even though they're being abused. There's somewhere in their soul that even though consciously they're saying, I need to get out of this and, and I need to grow and I need to, to move on, there's another piece of their soul that's saying, that knows, that's coded in there, I did something and this is coming back. It's kind of like that karmic effect. It's coming back to me and I have to work through this. Now, when we look at these situations, part of how we break these things is we don't have to sit there and take the abuse. We don't have to sit there and perpetuate the war cycles anymore. We don't have to continue creating this trauma to the soul because when we go through things that are as intense as battle and war and death, what happens is it's a multi-sensory experience. And that multi-sensory experience is what really creates something to get encoded in our DNA pattern, in our soul pattern. Because the more senses that we're absorbing it in through, then the stronger that experience resonates in us. And, and that's, that's where that trauma is really starting to set in because it's multisensory. We see that in war. We see that in abuse. We see that in poverty. We see that in all of the soul patterns. Healers. Healers are, are another pattern of alternating between being healers and being sickly along the way until they break the pattern. And so part of breaking this pattern is, for example, in an abuser victim pattern, is for that victim to stand up and say, enough. And that doesn't mean that they're fighting back. What it means is they're saying no more, and they honor getting themselves out of that situation. In wars, it's definitely a much bigger scope, and it's a much more intense area because you've got a lot more people involved when we're talking about wars. And certainly in, in some situations, you might be able to walk away, but you still may not end up alive from the situation, as we know in these areas where there are a lot of bombings or different things that go on. So uh, huge, huge pieces of things going on there, huge pieces of uh, of this puzzle that that come around. So very, very heavy um, trauma impact. And this is where PTSD comes in. Now, traditionally, when we first think of, of PTSD, we think of, of war times. That's the first natural aspect. And what they're finding is very interesting about PTSD because it can have a lot to do with what's happened earlier in our life, okay? Um, when we look at PTSD, if we've had a loving family to start with, if we have had support along the way, if we have had a stable family life that we, we have available to come home to and a support system, and we see this in areas that are still very, very family-oriented in countries where when people come back, they definitely can, can heal past some of these things. And, um, and, and it's a little bit easier for them to get past than if they come back and they have nobody to, to get back in there. So this is a very interesting thing, but PTSD also extends to other traumas in our life, such as abuse, 
um, it, it definitely extends beyond that. And it looks like Dr. Dorothy has just popped in to my call screen here, so I'm going to go ahead and open up her mic and bring her on and welcome her to the show. Hello, Dr. Dorothy. How are you? I am fine. Thank you. It's good to be here. I just it in. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I, I want to give everybody a little background. I've been talking here um, leading up to giving some insight because I've done past life regressions and things like that and, um, and dealt with soul cycles and giving people some insights of why we uh, fall into these patterns and why we choose some of these things and why there's sometimes some sense, what seems like senseless things to us happening in the world, um, and, and they really are part of these bigger cycles that go on. Um, I want to give everybody a little bit of, of just um, introduction to you and then give you a little chance to, to um, introduce your background as well and, and jump in here. Um, Certainly. Dr. Dr. Dorothy Nettemeyer, by the way, she's author of If I'd Only Known, Sex Abuse in or Out of the Family, A Guide to Prevention, She's a speaker and seminar leader with over 30 years of experience in personal and professional development. She is noted for her pioneering work in emotional, physical, and sexual abuse prevention and recovery. Dr. Niedermeyer, Niedermeyer excuse me, has a, a diplomat in professional psychotherapy and clinical Ericksonian neolinguistic hypnotherapy. She is a certified clinical hypnotherapist and regression therapist. She has a certificate of past life training with Brian Weiss, MD. She is a past president for the International Association for Regression Research and Therapies Incorporated. She's a board member for the Arizona Holistic Chamber of Commerce, a member with the uh, European Association for Regression Therapists, and has served as a faculty member for the World Congress for Regression Therapists, which has included the Netherlands, India, Brazil, and Turkey. She specializes in mind-body-spirit transformations for individuals, special issues, and professionals. And we're looking tonight at her work in reincarnation choices for those that have been in war and the aspect of perpetual war cycles. And as I said, this is the first of a three-part series dealing with PTSD and those that are uh, living and helping those with PTSD. So. I, again, I welcome you to the show, and I'm going to let you give a little background of how you got into all this. Well, thank you. I It's been an odyssey, more or less. Um, I never would have imagined myself being in this kind of work. I grew up on a cattle ranch in South Dakota, and it was the result of a family event that I was given a message and the message was, someday you will have a significant impact in people's lives. And that set me on the course of wondering how I was going to have a significant impact in people's lives. And I intuitively knew that the mental health field was not um, providing the services that people needed. And so I set out to read everything I could get a hold of and understand how the mind really works versus how we're told that the mind really works. Um, that our, our our mind is in one place and our body is in another place and the mind and the body don't have to interact with each other. Um, and so going through the all the material that and all the research um, that's, uh, that is available, I discovered that I was on the right track. And then I kind of, kind of got sidetracked because um, there was no training for what I wanted to do. And so the world kind of had to catch up with what I was going to do. And in the meantime, I was helping pe people intuitively heal, heal the deep emotional wounds that tr traditional therapy, talk therapy, and psychotherapy and psychiatry just was not even addressing. Treating symptoms, of course, is not the answer. The answer is to get down to the emotional and spiritual um, wounding 
that created the symptoms. And so that's in a nutshell, and here I've been doing it now. This is my 36th year, and it it is I'm learning new things every day in terms of what we can do, what the mind can do, what the subconscious mind can guide us to to heal. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> of course, I've always got questions. <laughs> um, uh, I I love task life regression because I feel like it can be such a great healer for the soul and and as I was talking about with these soul cycles uh, it can be a great tool for for breaking these cycles of of ending up in war after war or ending up in these abuse patterns and these victim patterns and uh, Mm -hmm. maybe you can share why for you it's such a powerful tool um, with PTSD in particular and 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 how maybe how you work with it a little bit to to heal that trauma. Well, it it is a powerful too simply because the mind is geared to heal itself and the body is set up so that it can heal itself. All the body parts have a specific job to do and it does that job unless there is emotional trauma that interferes with the energy that that particular body part is willing and able to do. Or if our food that we eat is is so toxic and so, um, you know, lifeless that we don't really get the nutrition that we we need and our body starts to... react to the lack of nutrition, the lack of uh, emotional and spiritual sustenance. And that's when we start having symptoms. And and also the emotional things that we go through leave scars behind. And when those scars are not healed, um, they keep getting triggered. So you could have something that took place when you were three years old or younger or older, and when something else comes along in your life and triggers that or bumps against it, it's sort of like um, a scab. When you have a scab and it gets bumped, it feels um, very painful. Well, that's the same way it is with our emotions. When we have an, an emotion that hasn't been healed from something that we experienced, it's like there's a scab there, but if it gets bumped, it's going to react and the symptom is going to rear up and then of course we want it to go away and the way that we've done it in the past or still do is to numb the pain rather than resolve the pain process the pain uh, take the person through the scenario of what was the original wound and that could be back in a previous lifetime um, because we do come here to resolve issues from the past as well as what we're in currently. And it's a part of the process of calling in experiences so that we wake ourselves up to what we came here to resolve. And the, the mind, actually, as far as hypnosis is concerned, our, our minds go into a trance many times during the day to be able to do the job that the mind is capable of doing, concentrating on an issue to the degree that we need to concentrate. And so really all the facilitator is doing or the person that does hypnosis is helping the person focus on a particular topic. We're not really doing anything that the mind doesn't already do. All we're doing is helping the mind focus on a particular topic. Right, that topic. helping it, helping it tune in to to where that origination Correct. point is, and and that's been part of my experience. Is when you get in there, you're there's two things. I mean, you can be reliving that experience to a certain extent, 
but it also gives you a chance to really understand where it originated from so that it can be healed. It's, It's helping to bring it into the conscious mind so you understand the, the patterns. Um, Correct. You an interesting point with there being a lack of spiritual substance, which is something I was kind of alluding to with the war cycles before you before you came in to the to the phone lines or to my switchboard. And mm-hmm. that is my experience is a lot of times people that are in those war cycles coming back and forth where they're they're alternating, you know, they're in a very reactionary stage, it's a very young soul stage and it, it kind of triggers that they're really seeking that spiritual substance but they don't know where or how to find it, so they keep repeating the cycle. Correct. Well and not only that, the the, the energy around that issue that hasn't been resolved keeps drawing it to you, T keeps drawing experiences to you to trigger that ev- that emotion so that it can be resolved. Mm-hmm. Because we do know on some level that that needs to be resolved, and the only way we can get it resolved is is if we keep bringing it up to ourselves, it, bringing our attention toward it. Our, our soul is kind of like a, a natural magnet. For wanting to heal, it's Correct. part of its whole purpose is trying. It's like a catalyst or a liaison to try to get us into spirit, <laughs> and right? And to wake us up and to be in that to wake us up to the fact that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, and we're humans having a spiritual experience. You know, a lot of times people want to know, what's my purpose in life? What am I doing here? Why did I come here? And, of course, they're looking for something, I think, that's a big uh, bang or a big noteworthy something or the other. And the, Mm -hmm. the soul's sole purpose for being in body is for spiritual and emotional growth. That's our sole purpose here. Everything else and is the everything else that we want to accomplish or that we do is the soul's desire. It, well, excuse me, the the ego desires that we have. We want to be the best uh, football player. We want to be the best um, at whatever we do in life, such as the best parent, uh, the best CPA the best lawyer, that's more ego-driven than it is soul-driven. I mean, the, exactly. soul goes, the soul goes along with it, but the soul sole purpose for being here is for emotional and spiritual growth. And it, and it wants us to heal these issues, which is why it keeps putting us in those situations so that we can gain strength in them. And Correct. It's not always pleasant as a human on the human side to uh, to go through these traumas or these experiences, uh, but I feel like you know the soul is looking at it as neutral. It's not there trying to hurt us. It's just trying to get us the experience that's going to heal us, which is why it keeps magnetizing things or we keep experiencing a trigger because when we get triggered, we haven't healed. Yet, if I'm correct. correct. Mm-hmm. And once and it's healed, it doesn't get triggered anymore, and the issue is it, it evaporates. It almost like evaporates into the ethers because there's and, nothing and when we there. Get, yeah, that's right. Nothing, nothing's there. It's, um, it's, it's kind of like somebody could be. Uh, they could they could be jealous. Uh, they could be they could be dealing with jealousy, um, mm-hmm. and they continue to be jealous and be jealous until they get an experience where they don't have to be jealous. Right. And it starts to heal. And then when things come up, they they realize that okay, I can heal this issue. 
and I can get past this issue. And Mm -hmm. realizing that, okay, I've got this pattern and I've got this tendency, so I need to take some conscious steps to it. And that seems to me where that's a big part of where regression comes in to bringing that consciousness to light so we can look at it and then start to take those steps. Correct. And the, the, what what people are anxious about is they think that if they allow themselves to get into the feelings associated with the experience, that it's going to be so painful that they won't be able to handle it. Well, guess what? If you're still breathing, you handled it so far. And so the same mm-hmm. that strength and courage that you used to, survive, you can use that same strength and courage to heal. So the pain that you're in is never worse than the pain that it takes to heal. In other words, the pain, it, gets, the pain gets worse if we don't heal it. Exactly. The pain actually gets worse because the the mind key the the subconscious mind keeps banging up against the the conscious mind uh more vigorously, gives us more pain to get us to wake up that this needs to be addressed, this needs to be brought to fruition. And the other unfortunate thing in, in Western society is that we we think that ev- everything is a uh, disease. And that started in the late 50s, early 60s, where we started calling everything a disease. And that was done specifically so that they could make a pill uh, for it, and make a diagnosis and have a pill for it. Mm-hmm. So that's why we, it's PTSD. It's PTS. No D, D is necessary. It's called post-traumatic mm-hmm. stress. There's no need for the D, but they put the D on right. there because that stands for disease so that they can prescribe pills for it, meaning that now it's legal. Now they can legally say that you have a disease that they will provide a pill for, they meaning the medical profession or the psychiatric profession, which is a specialty of the medical profession. You know, you, you 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 can specialize in geriatrics. You can specialize in in an, um, obstetrics or gynecology, and you can then specialize in psychiatry, which means that that's your area of specialty uh, where you're going to use pills because psychiatrists right. don't know anything about processing. And you know, I'm. Yeah, they they're not about processing. They're about issuing drugs. They're about issuing lot of drugs, and telling you that you will need to be on drugs for the rest of your life. And then some people do, um, you know, go on the internet and find um, people on the internet that can help them to heal. That's where well, where most of. I think too, in a in a so-called pill society, you've got a lot of people and that they don't have a lot of the support systems as much today. Even though we have more organizations out there, they don't necessarily have as much in the way of support systems that they used to have, say, 50, 60, 70 years ago during war times. Well, um, that, you know, that... when we're in World War One or something like that. They knew they were coming home to family. Families were still intact. You don't right. have that security today, and they're showing that the the rate of people coming out of war that are dealing with a post-traumatic syndrome is much higher than it used to be. And it seems to me that you're, you combine that with a society that teaches you to numb or treat the symptom and you've got a lot of people that just want the easy way out, which is a pill, but it doesn't allow them to deal with it. Correct. Yes. So it is a, but we're, we, 
little by little we're climbing out of that pit. And it's a, a steep climb, but more and more people are fed up with the the, the revolving door of more pills and more pills and pills and more pills. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think because of the Internet, people are even being more verbal about their opinions that pills are not the answer. And so people are exploring the possibility that maybe there is a, a better way. And they keep looking and looking for uh, material, looking for articles, etc., to substantiate that they can find somebody that does it a different way. That, mm-hmm. that there is a different protocol versus pills. And I think the holistic methods are more acceptable these days. And gradually you have some insurance companies that are covering holistic treatments, and that helps as well. And and it helps somebody, you know, with somebody like you that also has that doctor credential that can deal with insurance. (laughs) Um, Well, yes, um, and and, and, but we're we're restricted a lot in. in, in regard to uh, what they'll actually pay for. Um, and as far as the mental health part of it is concerned, they will pay for that because if I use hypnosis as a way to help my clients heal, that does not have to go on on the statement, just the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So I can use right. hypnosis, I can use past life regression to get to help my client heal, um, and it still gets paid for. It's the other holistic health care that doesn't get paid for. Um, mm-hmm. And they are doing some paying for acupuncture. There's, they're paying for massage therapists. They're paying more companies. are paying for chiropractors. But they're, they're, the medical doctor, when they make the diagnoses, they want to do surgery immediately, they want to use radiation and chemotherapy immediately and not even give the person a chance to think about it because they know if they give them a chance to think about it, they might go on the Internet and find out that there's a a better way to resolve it. And cheaper than their deductible. (laughs) And cheaper than their deductible. And yeah, I you know it's a hundred thousand dollars. I I believe is the average um, price to have radiation and chemotherapy. And your deductible after that, uh, then you eat, I don't know if uh, maybe it's eighty percent, maybe it's fifty uh, percent. So I, I'm sorry, but the irony to in that to me is that that what they're dealing with is emotional. And they're strictly doing something that's affecting the physical and creating more emotional trauma. Mm-hmm. Like it's compounding that trauma factor to me. And when you delve into some of those things, then of course you're you, these people who are already struggling to a certain extent then end up with deeper depression or other things from the radiation and and such. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, how does somebody start to break these patterns or cycles? I mean, we know that you can use hypnosis or hypnotherapy or regression as as a technique. So how do they progress? Let's say they get in there and they they say, "Man, I'm I'm stuck in this war cycle. I keep going back and fighting over and over again and." whatever war is going on in the culture and times and uh, you know I, I have these triggers and I have this trauma for continuing that pattern uh, how do I break it well it it is a matter of taking the event that you were in and seeing it from different angles the ego mind can see from only two angles right wrong good bad Negative, positive, that's the ego mind. But the subconscious mind and the soul mind, if you will, and there is such a thing as a soul mind, and I I know that sounds a little woo-woo or a little far out, 
but the the <laughs> soul does have its own voice, and the subconscious mind and the soul voice can speak as one or they can speak separate. And you have them look f- at it from the soul level and the subconscious level, and there's many awarenesses that can come to them that says you weren't guilty, you, you, you have nothing to be ashamed of because they hold a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Uh, I could have done something different. I could have done it better. I could have thought faster, whatever they are telling themselves. And they process that and let go of it and forgive themselves. Forgiveness is the key, and and forgiveness is setting yourself free of any wrongdoing, even though you made a mistake in your decision-making process. You could say, okay, I see where I made my mistake, but given the information that I had at the time, it was the only decision that, that I could have made. And so I can let go of trying to second-guess myself and let go of um, holding myself responsible for something that that couldn't have been any different than it was. And so that's how the healing takes place, is the seeing it from all the angles that the subconscious mind and the soul mind can see it from and forgive oneself for any wrongdoing or any error and it does. It, it, it just. I, I can't. It's almost like there's no words to describe it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and if you ask somebody who's been through the process, nobody describes it the same way. Uh, so I think that that's true. You know, definitely that they they don't describe it exactly the same way. And I think a lot of people do get hung up in that guilt. I think you bring up a really great point with that, uh, of of getting hung up on the guilt. And we forget that, you know, we didn't have the knowledge 20 years ago in our life that we have now to work with. So if we did, we would have made a different decision. But given the circumstances we're in, in that moment, we did the best we could with what we had in that moment with our understanding mm-hmm. at that time. Correct. And and I think there's another piece that then starts to play in to it that when you start to forgive, you get yourself out of the past and into the present. And the question starts becoming, okay, I, I did this, I've learned it may not have been the best or the smartest choice, or there might have even been a different option, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't at that time. And what am I going to do now? I think that becomes the next question. What am I going to do now? Where do I go from here? Right, and the forgiveness sets you free. Sets you Mm -hmm. free to live the life that you deserve to live um, and can live. It's the forgiveness that sets you free. And some people haven't forgiven themselves for many lifetimes. They're continuing to come back, having not forgiven themselves, and then what happens is they set up another scenario that's very similar to the one that they had in the previous lifetime so that they can go through it again and the idea is forgive themselves. Um, sometimes the lifetime this time around is a mirror image of the lifetime, the previous lifetime. Now that could have been four or five lifetimes ago, or it mm-hmm. could have been the previous life, just the previous one to this one. And incidentally, to just for edification, to the soul, there is no past lives. It's all one. Mm-hmm. It, it, to the soul, the soul sees it as just a continuum of its eternal existence. They just look at it as, oh, I was in that body, in that circumstance, and that's what I did. And then when we take on another body, we take on the ego 
construct and we start talking about past this or past that and the bl- the black and white, the right and the wrong, the good and the bad. Right. Yeah, because that ego is very related to judgment. and Correct. Um, and and it wants us, you know, it wants that attention. It wants some place to blame things or or whatever it is uh, in there. And so forgiveness can be a tricky thing for a lot of people. And I think this is a big point uh, for for people because. I know I've heard a lot of people say, I can't forgive myself. Correct. I can't forgive my being in this situation or putting my child through this or treating somebody this way. How do you help somebody get to that forgiveness then when they're in that sense of, I, I don't think I can? Right. Well, see, it's not for some people. Of course, it's more difficult than others. It depends on a lot of different factors. It could be religious factors. It could be family values. It could be that they are acting out rage from several lifetimes ago. I did have one that was acting out rage. Um, His experience in a previous lifetime was um, in early American history where the people were moving off of the east coast and coming in inland in what we call the united states and so a lot of people were being killed by the native americans whose lives were being encroached on and whose whose homeland was being encroached on and his family was massacred he he was the only one in his family that survived and he was going to, he wanted to carry out a grudge for the for eternity because he was so angry that his his life was his wife and children were killed um so we took i took him through that and and he was able to see the um fallacy of his beliefs and he did he was able to forgive himself and his life has been has been improved a thousand percent since but yes, it can be very ingrained. There's a an old cliche and I don't you may have heard it, I'm going to eat this poison and watch you die. Mm. Because the anger, the rage that you're turning against yourself is your own poison. So if I stay angry enough, maybe you will die. Mhm. Who whoever I'm angry with. So there is two two forms of forgiveness forgiving myself for any errors or omissions and forgiving others who have caused me harm. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that person who's caused me harm may not be having any sleepless nights, yet I'm the one who has the sleepless nights. And I'm just using sleepless nights as a cliche. Um, So the forgiveness is... uh, Two, two levels, one to forgive myself and one to forgive the other person or persons or circumstances. And that that's such an important part, I think, as we, we emerge um, as a whole, as a race. Correct. Is this forgiveness, because there's too many places that I see it where people are holding grudges and anger for things they weren't even a part of, at -hmm. least, you know, on any conscious level. Now, maybe they were in a past life a part of it, and that's part of where it's coming from, but they're carrying it on, say, for their race or their country or something else. Mm -hmm. And and they, they want to hold everybody that was involved i mean it would be like it would be like holding the native americans uh, in all of this anger for attacking people um but yet you and i were never there but we're going to hold them that way because they did it to some piece of our ancestor mm-hmm. you know 
it, it just, you know, at some point we just have to say we're going to forgive this. You know, the Native American that's standing here today is not necessarily the person that was standing there <laughs> at the time this happened. Way they back had when, not, yeah. Way back when. And I'm certainly not the person that was standing there. Now, maybe we were in past lives, but the reality of it is is at some point we have to say, are we going to allow ourselves to be held down by these restrictive patterns, or mm-hmm. are we going to choose to heal? Right. Well, Chief um, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce uh, Native Americans, um, they the Nez Perce, Perce it's N E S and then P E P E A P Perce P E R C E uh, Native Americans. Chief Joseph, when the uh, government came, the U.S. government came to round up the Native. Um, Americans in the Northwest uh, gave a speech for the media and said, I will fight no more forever. Mm -hmm. And so what he was saying in that is that I forgive all my enemies and I will create peace for myself forever because I'm not going to fight, not not within myself or with anybody else. And and that's a big point, not fighting mm-hmm. within ourselves as well as not fighting with others. Correct. I, 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 it's part of my personal belief that most of the fighting we have with other people is really a fight with ourselves. Correct. So if someone we is under your skin... We something else, but it's really a fight with ourselves. Mm-hmm. And if there's someone's under, under your skin or bugging you, then you need to look at yourself. What is that person reflecting back to me that I don't like in myself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we see that, for example, with abuse patterns um, where somebody's a victim and there's an abuser there and they've drawn that in and they're seeing the abuser as the person being abusive to them when in reality they're abusing themselves by staying there. Mm Mm-hmm. How would you, with with these patterns that we have going on, I mean, obviously, obviously it's probably going to come down to, again, this aspect of forgiveness and souls that haven't healed along the way. How do you say that some of all of this explains some of our larger events um, or at least plays a role into things such as, Middle Eastern wars or, um, you know, some of the killings, the Sandy Hook things or Boston Marathon stuff or some of these world events that we see happening. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very, it, it's very complex and we, how do I say this, um, it, we come in to resolve issues and to resolve issues, we may have set it up so that we are involved in those kinds of things. And Mm -hmm. it is our way of evening the score, so to speak. We, We talk about soulmates, and there's three different kinds of soulmates. And the soulmate that everybody talks about is the one that's their 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 deepest love relationship, the 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 one that's for them. That's their that's a soulmate. Yes, that's one kind of soulmate. But the other kinds of soulmates are ret- retribution soulmates, where we you've come in 
this lifetime to meet up with these souls and you're going to even the score or you're going to work it out one way or the other. And then the third mm-hmm. one is someone is your soul your soul group that you came here with to to work out all the knots and they keep holding up the mirror for you. So everybody in your family you chose to come here with them and and and, and friends that come into your life or bosses that come into your life and a lot of times people go to work for their their dad or they go to work for their mother but of course it's not their biological mothers but because they haven't worked out their issues with their b- biological parent they may go to work for that parent in the work environment and and work on settling it that way and yet it doesn't get settled because it seems like just a thorn in your side Mm-hmm. Um, so when somebody is bugging you, look at yourself and find out what it is that that kernel that's it's like a, a piece of sand in your shoe or a, a burr under your saddle, because that's someone holding up a mirror. Right. And when you get it worked out, then you, the, their behavior will not change but your reaction to their behavior will change. And then, of course, when your reaction to their behavior changes, they go somewhere else because mm-hmm. they're acting out that behavior because that was their agreement when they came here. And at some point, they may get the idea that, hmm, you know, I'm getting tired of this old, this kind of behavior. I think I'll change it. So then they start right. gravitating toward people who they don't need to hold up that mirror. Because we are mirrors for each other. We come back in soul groups, and I mentioned that briefly. We come back in soul groups, and in our soul group, we've, we've been together in many for many lifetimes, possibly, or maybe just one or two. But that soul group comes because I, I hold the perfect mirror for some of my family members, and they held the perfect mirror for me. Mm-hmm. And, of course, my parents um, held a perfect mirror for for me, um, and my mother held a perfect mirror for me with regard to no, recognizing that people are deceptive, meaning that they may say be doing and saying one thing, but underneath there's something else going on, and I need to pay attention to the something else rather than what I see on the surface. Right, and because there definitely are those bigger patterns beyond what we're seeing correct. Um, there. And sometimes and I, I've learned that when people are wondering, well, I wonder what my spiritual path is or I wonder what my passion is that I'm supposed to be following. And a lot of times it's right there in that irritating situation. And when I say that, it's because that pet peeve, that thing that irritates you the most, can easily be healed, I think, also, once you've brought it to life through, say, regression or something, um, or, or whatever tool has been used, by then taking it and turning it into a mission or a passion to heal that wound in others as well. Correct. So if if we have an abusive situation that we tend to be in and we you know this is irritating to us then part of our sole mission may very well be to teach others how to not be abusive or to delve into communications for relationships or to help people learn how to not be a victim or things like this. Right. Absolutely. And it's almost the, the correlation is in perfect balance. You know, the universe is very impeccable with return, with regard to energy being in perfect balance. 
So the person who's bugging you the most, that's the person that you need to stay close to so that you can figure out what it is that you need to do so that that person doesn't bug you anymore. Mm-hmm. Because if you and, and this figure, this is challenging for people because they they wonder, well, here's somebody who's so nice, why are they always getting picked on? Or you know, here's somebody that did all these charitable things, why why would they be under attack or end up in this bomb situation or right or whatever it is? And it's, yes, they were there serving a purpose, as you say, part of a soul retribution or. Mm-hmm. There's something bigger there. Correct. So we are here also as soul groups, but even if you we aren't in someone's necessarily someone's soul soul group, we can draw their energy in as well to learn something that we need to learn. So then we mm-hmm. become sort of like a a soul a soul uh mate or it becomes a soul connection um in our lives and that person may be in the li- in our life for the rest of our life or they may be just there for a short period of time and then trends you know they go on about their life and go somewhere else um so when someone is bugging you you you, you really need to look at your own own issues and not so much about the fact that they're just being mean to you or that they're just annoying the heck out of you. What is it that I need to learn? What is it that I need to come to grips with? What do I need to understand? And when you ask that question, it opens up the water. It opens up the door to for the answer to come to you because the universe holds all answers to all questions. But if you don't ask the question, it's very difficult to hear the answer. Because the answer is there. You, you're just not listening for it because you haven't asked the question. Right. Well, what can I learn from this? When something comes up for me, you know, and I'm annoyed with it or maybe even not annoyed, maybe I'm thrilled with it. And I can say, I always, I ask myself, what can I learn from this? And and I think that's hard sometimes for people to get themselves used to doing that. I, I know I with the clients I work with I'm I'm oftentimes trying to get them there, um to realize that there's something bigger there that you need to learn from the situation. Mm-hmm. There's there's a bigger pattern, there's and that that most of the time the people that are acting out are not truly doing it from a place of just pure evil intent to harm you. There's a no. bigger pain. There's a bigger pain. There's a, a trauma that they've been through that hasn't been healed. And that's not excusing their behavior, but there's something there that they haven't looked at, discovered, or become conscious of. Correct. And the, the truth of the matter is there is that emotional wound that they are struggling with. And their behavior is specifically, even though they are they may be dinging you, um, their behavior is specifically to ward off or to distance themselves from their own emotional pain. Mm-hmm. And you just happen to be... Um, in the in the in the fray of what they are doing, if that makes sense, it is, and it's it's really not a lot different than a child who throws a tantrum or a baby that starts crying, because Correct. all they know is they have pain and they don't understand it and they don't know how to fix it. So they know, though, if they scream loud enough and they cause enough turbulence that somebody around them will figure out how to fix it. 
well, that's what the, that's what they uh, are looking for. But sometimes, you know, how often does that actually take place? So rather than punishing the child for having a temper tantrum um, or for doing something that they know specifically they it is not the right thing to do because you've told them how many times, they're wanting to get your attention. Mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, and, and, and interestingly enough, children can can bounce back. They can turn on a dime if they're heard. Everybody wants to be heard. Adults want to be heard. Children want to be heard. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, of course, children when they're very very young, they're not. They aren't verbal enough to give you words, but you can figure it out. And, of course, the younger they are, the easier it is to figure it out because there's only so many choices that are of, that are really in play for the child. And as they get older as toddlers, then, of course, things get a little more complex. But even then, you can ask a lot of questions. And interestingly enough, they know. They know what's bugging them. They absolutely know. You just need to ask the right question, and you can. If it doesn't fit, they'll say no. And, and if they, and I think this, this is sometimes how we need to approach some of these people who are more abusive and stuff. Is approaching them the way we would approach a child, and realize absolutely they're a well, young in, soul, and they don't always know. <laughs> correct. And, you know, if we also, in the training, that um, the hostage, people who hold other people hostage, they have the hostage team come in to negotiate with the, host- the person who's holding everybody hostage. And the first mm-hmm. thing they do is to find out what that person wants. Right. That's why they held somebody hostage. It wasn't the money in the bank that they're they they may be holding people people hostage in the bank. Well, it's really not the money, although they claim right. that's what they want. It's to be heard. To be and heard. so the first thing the negotiators do is find out what we can do to have common ground here, so we can talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the same. Same with everybody. Everybody wants to be heard. Now, we may not agree on everything, but if I'm understood and I'm heard, I, I can, I'm willing then to make concessions or I'm willing to maybe do something slightly different. But if I'm not heard, I'm going to be resist trying to be manipulated or maneuvered or told what to do. So right. when you hear, yeah, when you hear someone, truly hear them, and it can't be lip service either. You need to right. let the person know that you've heard them, and, and you do that by that's a whole paraphrase. Learning how to truly hear <laughs> somebody. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a couple callers in, but I'm sure. I'm running very close on time. Uh, I'm going to open it up and see if we can maybe take one caller here. And, okay. Uh, if they can make it really, really quick for us, and let's see what they've they've got. Um, I'm going to go in here to five four one area code. You're on the air five four one. Good morning. Uh, hi. Did you How have a you? question tonight? I'm good. Did you have a question? Let me talk to your mother. Okay, um, yeah, we're having some sound issues there. I can't hear you, so I apologize for that. Um, just was coming in really faint there. So, anyways, um, well, that that made it quick, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it sure did. So, yeah, that's, that's too bad. We just couldn't really hear him in there. Um, so, this is great. I mean, I think you've given us some really great insight tonight as far as how to you know, the things that regression can do for us and, you know, how they can um, deal with it and that the the key factor here is forgiveness is what's going to set people free. And, um, and looking 
and learning how to heal and understanding why we draw these different patterns or end up in these different patterns in our life. So I think that that's definitely very been some very valuable information. And um, I'm glad that you could jump in. During part of the show, I was <laughs> I was like, I hope she's still going to be able to make it tonight. Yes, well, I think there was a misunderstanding with regard to time this evening because I'm, of the different time zones. And I thought yeah. I was coming in at the right time, and I was later than I than you had anticipated. So I apologize I, for that. And oh, I figured um, I figured something there, and it happens sometimes. So fortunately, I have a background in doing past life regression, so I <laughs> I talked yeah, away so for were, a while. You were able to talk about it, and you know the other thing that we are seeing more of, and this you may have talked about this is the the twin soul we talked about your soul mates the three different soul mates but then there's another phenomena that's called twin souls and or twin flames and that simply means that the the two souls are the other half of each other mhm so when we were Did we pushed have... off the very beginning of the show that was that was our message for the week was related to that concept of oh, soulmate. Really? Was soulmate. So it was funny that you brought that in without even hearing that part of the show. Um, right. I do so the, 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 the the I use the seventy is God twin soul. Yeah. Mhm. Well I've enjoyed uh, our time together. I'm I'm definitely happy that you made it here and um your website, by the way, drdorothy.info is it, and you've got lots of great information on there um, for people to delve into. Did, what What did you want to share as far as your contact and people reaching you? Well, certainly um, I have a form on the, the – you can send an email to me at drdorothy at drdorothy.net. Um you know, the doctor, D-R, and then Dorothy, D-O-R-O-T-H-Y, at drdorothy.net. Uh, and you can go on the website and read a lot of articles and a lot of information, as you said. Or you can call me by phone, 480-794-1561. And I'm also on Skype. Dorothy Ned N E D because somebody had already taken Doctor Dorothy when by the time <laughs> I got on to Skype. Uh so it's Dorothy Ned D O R O T H Y N E D the first three letters of my last name on Skype. And I do Skype sessions, phone sessions, I do hypnosis and regression work and past life over the phone. So I work with people all over the world. Mhm. Which is fantastic. Enough. It, it's fantastic, and and I encourage people that want to find out more about your work to to make that connection with you. And uh, we've been talking tonight about regression, about past lives, uh, soul cycles, and we've had Dr. Dorothy Nettermeyer on. And I want to thank you for being here tonight, giving us your time, coming in because it's certainly been enjoyable to have you share these concepts with us and to, to start the first of these the series of three shows dealing with PTSD and understanding it and, and working with it. So I, I very much appreciate you giving us your time tonight. And uh, she's she's been sharing with us her work tonight on using hypnotherapy and past life regression to help people with PTSD and to explain war cycles. You can, again, look at more of her work at www.drdorothy.info, and that is uh, D-R-D-O-R-O-T-H-Y dot I-N-F-O. And uh, that, you know, again, we appreciate you being here, and, and I appreciate well, you calling in Well, thank you for tonight. having me. It's been a pleasure, Absolutely. Uh, next week, coming on our show, I've got Shelly Beach and Wanda Sanchez. They are from PTSD Perspectives. They were going to be looking at their work. We're going to look at their work with PTSD and how to understand it better, how to deal with people in your life that have PTSD, because it's not just the person that has it and that's going through this trauma, 
but also the people that are in their life that are dealing with them, spouses, children, caretakers, things like that as well. So it's a bigger scope, and we're going to be looking at how to do that because light workers oftentimes are in caretaker positions, and we need to, to learn about that replenishment and, and how to keep our energy up when we're, when we're working with people of, of these challenges. Uh, my next set of books will be coming out soon again. I've got them written. It's just a matter of getting them through the publishing process right now, and uh, they'll be available soon. I also have several events up, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show. You can follow those events as well as events that will be coming up on the Compassion Tour at jessieannicholsgeorge.eventbrite.com, and that's uh, happening through the end of August. I've got things booked every single weekend through the end of August. I'm working on putting together that 2013 tour, which looks like it's going to take me up the West Coast region through California, um, possibly right now I'm looking at in the fall being up into Colorado, or I'll be in Colorado first weekend of October, and uh, going actually up into the Vancouver area. So lots of regions that I'll be touching on there. And if you'd like to find out more about the work I'm doing with Compassion, connect with me, check out my blog, purchase products, see the services I offer, find ways to connect with me, listen to archive shows, watch video tips, all those great things. I do have a new video tip that's out as well. You can do that on my website at jessieannicholsgeorge1, that's the number one, dot com. There's a great section on that website for all of the Main Street Universe shows and hosts there. You can learn more about them. And uh, my book is available on there as well. I do have a special still running for the month of June, which is shorter coaching and reading sessions going on. I'm offering a 20-minute session for $30 and a 10-minute session for $15. And you just uh, can email me at jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at jesseannicholsgeorge1. Again, that's the number one, dot com. And I'm going to actually go ahead and continue that special through the month of July. So if you missed out on that, it's going to be a great chance to to catch it. Uh, There's also options. I've got an Indiegogo campaign running, uh, which is uh, www.indiegogo.com forward slash, uh, what was it, projects or something like that. Um, Yes, forward slash projects, forward slash the hyphen compassion hyphen tour hyphen 2013 and uh, that'll get you in where you can contribute on that tour there's a great video on there i've got a lot of videos up right now um, talking about the genesis clearing statement talking about jesse's quantum club which is a great new club that i created so if you haven't had the chance to explore that you might want to also check that out um, uh, and and that's a great option, you can check that out actually at jessiesquantumclub.eventbrite.com. And just a reminder, we've got several shows right here on Main Street Universe throughout the week. Darren Bouquer, who's a reader also at Madame Louveau in New Orleans, does, does uh, Spiritual Insights. That's on Sunday nights, so he kind of starts off the week there. Monday nights is Kevin Baird walking on the sidewalk, working with his Horizon Oracle Journeys deck. It's a deck that he created. You can learn more about that deck at templeofgaia.com. Tuesdays, we have Inner Wisdom with Mary Phelan. Um, absolutely awesome show. So that's three reading shows, basically back-to-back if you're ever looking for readings and insights. Uh, you want to get a free, free reading on something that's happening in your life. Those are our shows to go to for that. Um, all three of them really good. All three a little bit different style. Then Wednesday nights, we have our flagship show called Main Street Universe, and that includes Danielle, Janice, and Brett, all co-host, or all hosting that show together on Wednesday nights. And, of course, Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour right here on Friday nights. If you've missed any part of the show tonight, um, please go back and listen to the archives on this. And also share it with your friends, your family, your social media, and Facebook buddies. This is Jesse Ann Nichols George. I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you back here next week as we delve more into activating compassion. Don't forget, again, if you've missed the show or if you've enjoyed it, if you missed any part of it, it's available at the same link in the archives. 
and I'm going to leave you with Yearning For, also known as Over and Over by Shem Shai. I want to thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again next week right here on Activating Compassion in the Midnight Hour. May you enjoy the rest of your weekend and have an amazing week. And... And if I could see what makes me blind I would soar to the edge of my mind And to touch what seems unreal Just to show you the way that I feel And we are in time with time One with the season of change inside And we are in tune with the two Caught in a balance of sun and moon Oh, deep inside The light within Shining to show you It's here to begin When all I have Is all I need I will soar to the edge of me Love is still burning deep in your spirit.